good morning today i am going to talk about uh, socio biological basis of corruption this is based upon the talk and invited public lecture that i had given almost 13 years ago in pune since uh, then lot of water has flown through the ganges and again the issue of corruption is very much in the news because recently the supreme court gave a very um, great judgment on the electoral bonds which were is a outcome of crony capitalism and other corrupt practices so i thought that it is this is a good time to talk about or make a podcast of my lecture that i gave almost 13 years ago <clears throat> this lecture was given uh, was organized by in search uh, it's a deem deem university which is based in pune and they had a series of uh, uh, distinguished speakers talking on the subject and the title of my talk was socio biological basis of corruption relevance to corporate world good evening ladies and gentlemen i am delighted and honored to give this talk in the annual in search public lecture series i must thank dr ramakrishna for inviting me and his all his colleagues at in search for making it possible unfortunately dr ramakrishna passed away last year so this is also a lecture in his memory normally i give talks about my work on sustainable development but being a concerned citizen of this great country i am also deeply troubled just like all of you by the rise of corruption and hence grab the opportunity of talking about it the theme of this year's lectures is corruption and corporate sustainability it is a very timely topic and i am told that competent people from corp- corporate world are also speakers in this series i think they are more qualified to talk about your corporate sustainability and corruption and hence i will focus my talk on what makes us greedy and insecure the two driving forces of corruption thus i will talk about socio biological basis of corruption and will allude briefly later on uh, how it affects the corporate sustainability corruption is nothing new in our society or any other society of the world as long as humans are greedy corruption will always remain in a celebrated story in the panchatantra the ancient indian fable the greed of a jackal makes the lion kill his best friend the bull and the whole delightful story is about how slowly but surely the cunning jackal seduces the lion into thinking that the bull his best friend is his greatest enemy in the same way the nexus of corrupt politicians some corporate houses builders etc has systematically looted the system and the country even in the so called developed countries the corruption exists but at the high at a very high level what is horrible in india is the amount depth and pervasiveness of corruption and according to some estimates each year india loses about 1 trillion dollars worth of money because of corruption similarly some others have estimated that almost 100 lakh crore of ill gotten money is stashed by indians in foreign banks one is not sure of the source or the veracity of these numbers but the fact remains that they are very large recently a huge amount of cash and jewelry have been unearthed in so called ashrams and mandirs even godmen are not immune to corruption since huge money is involved in mandirs it is quite possible that in the near future we may even have a ministry of mandir affairs the first casualty of corruption is governance 
So most of the problems that our country is facing today have come about because of non-governance. Right from the top to the bottom, rules are flouted with impunity. This also leads to a free-for-all situation, which further fuels corruption and is the reason why it has seeped so deeply into our country's fabric. Since there is no governance, firefighting by ruling elite is the order of the day and is done on whatever comes to their vision field as dictated mostly by the TV news media. Mind you, this lecture was given in 2011 at the time when the Anna's anti-corruption movement was at, at its nadir. Non-governance also leads to terrorism which affects the financial health of the country and has a direct bearance, bearing on corporate India. Thus, it is the interest of the corporate India to, wor to work for and further the cause of corruption-less society. The greed that fuels corruption also so shows up in other things. For example, a top corporate honcho jets frequently in his private plane to New York just in order to do a four hours of shopping. A state-of-the-art jet is used by all top politicians. It is also a classical case of collusion between the corporate world and corrupt politicians. Another corporate bigwig lives in a house costing more than 4,500 crores, while all around his multi-story house are poor people's huts. The splurging of wealth and the extravagant lifestyle of corporate India is creating a huge disparity in the population and could be an engine of corruption and civil strife. As a well-known writer, P. Sainath has said, the fastest growing sector in India is not the service sector or the IT sector, but the inequality sector. <clears throat> the ra rise of Maoist and Nexalite movements in one third of the country could be a direct outcome of this inequality. One also wonders how the great tradition of patriotic freedom fighters who are honest and honorable people and who lived very simply gave place to extremely dishonest, unsavory and corrupt politicians living in an extravagant lifestyle far removed from their constituency. This transformation did not happen overnight but is a result of the slow and steady deterioration of public life and hence the can cancer of corruption has spread very deeply into the fabric of our country. And now with the modern means of communication like mobile phones, Twitter, internet, etc., people have become aware of it and are getting organized against it. This has created a critical mass of anger and frustration and hence the general outcry that you presently hear. Today is the 9th August or Kranti Divas. It was on this day in 1942 that Mahatma Gandhi gave a national call for the British to quit India. Maybe we should take a pledge today to get rid of corruption from our country. And we cannot do it in one day but becoming aware of it and thinking about how and what can we do individually will greatly help in this cleanup process. Almost all of us, sometime or the other, have been a victim of corruption. We regularly face an occasion where somebody either in railways, income tax, offices, in the banks, in the RTO or in almost every place where we have to deal with an organization of the government's office asks for a bribe. Too often the justification for giving a bribe is to expedite the process since bureaucratic red tape causes a long delay. Besides, bribes are given to avoid hassles since the laws and rules of this country Unfortunately, as such that the government officials have an enormous power to harass and cause pain to ordinary citizens, making their life miserable. Nevertheless, we always have a tendency to blame the officers of these organizations and the government, but never ourselves, though corruption is a two-way street. The acceptor of the graft and its giver are both responsible for corruption. As individuals, we are therefore equally responsible for this sorry state of affairs. There are nearly 1 billion adults in this country and each one of us will have a story to tell about the corruption and may even have a theory on how to stop it. 
However, I feel that most of the remedies for stopping corruption, like make, making better and harsher laws, are like ointments which superficially and momentarily stop the pain, but never cure the cause of the pain. It is worth noting that there are already enough laws to stop corruption, provided they are implemented properly. In the absence of governance, making more laws may not be very productive. So today in my talk, I will therefore try to present a point of view for why we as individuals become greedy for materials and resources and how we can modify and use the greed emotion for pursuing better causes. Because once we understand the cause, then only we can take corrective actions. Most of these things that I'll discuss today have come from my own experiences of trying to live a simple, sustainable and holistic life in Dugal Maharaj. And I have written the blogs and articles on how I live and one can access these. Uh, uh, I'll, I'm giving the URL of these um, uh, how I live in this uh, podcast. Genesis of corruption. All of us aspire to have a good life and happiness. There are as many definitions of happiness as there are people. But generally people want to have their basic needs taken care of, which includes a decent place to live, mobility, good education for their children, clean environment, a challenging workplace, good and wholesome entertainment, and enough money to meet their usual daily requirements. These are the issues around which modern industrial societies have evolved, and yet these are the issues which have created the biggest problem of totally unsustainable lifestyles fueled by greed. For example, most Indians aspire to have a lifestyle of Western nations, which is very consumptive, energy intensive and unsustainable. Thus, in the US, the per capita energy consumption is around 300 to 350 gigajoules per year, whereas in India, it is a low of 18 to 25 gigajoules per year. If each citizen of India tries to live like an American lifestyle, then the whole world's energy and material resources will just be needed for India. Besides being unsustainable, this lifestyle will also lead to corruption, disparity, and other consequent social problems. Hence, the control of greed for resources and energy, or better yet, the sublimation of greed emotions into higher ones like humility and simplicity can lead to sustainability, happiness, and a rewarding life. I believe that an emotionally satisfying life is possible with much, much less energy than is consumed by an, an average US citizen. I have lived such a life for the last 35-40 years and I have given the URL of how I live in the podcast. Thus, an energy consumption of 40 to 60 gigajoules per person per year or one-seventh that of US can provide a decent and emotionally satisfying lifestyle. This type of energy consumption will put much less pressure on Earth's resources besides reducing substantially the environmental pollution. However, it can only be possible only when we reduce our greed by becoming spiritual and follow the maxim of simple living and high thinking. The basis of greed is desire. Desire manifests itself in different forms like lust, aim, ambition, control, goal, etc. How the driving force is the same, power, fame and money. And I think ultimately boils down to control and hence power. Some also call it an ego trip. As our brains develop right from our birth, the fast expanding neuron mem numbers have to form memory pathways. This, this process is accomplished by sensory perception where the inputs from the senses help form the memory. We are therefore hardwired 
to increase our experience and memories. This is the basis of desire. Hence, desire and brain are interlinked. As long as the brain exists, there will always be desire. Desire is fueled by experience. A living being ex wants to experience the world. This is an inherent trait of all life forms. We are wired for experience. Urge for maximization of experience fuels the desire. Whether the desire is for sex, money, fame, power, etc., it is always driven by the same need to maximize experience. Another One of the outcomes of desire is possession. We feel a need to possess whatever we desire, whether it is a person, object, or even an idea. Possession helps in maximization of our experience, and as we absorb experience through our senses, the brain processes this information. It is during this process that we decide whether our desires are fulfilled or not. Fulfillment of desires, therefore, helps us in releasing the possessions. A powerful processor or the mind can get its desires fulfilled quite easily without physically possessing the objects of desire. While, on the other hand, a weaker brain needs to possess a lot more things for, full, for fulfillment of desires and this leads to greed. Therefore, to live a sustainable life, it is necessary to have a very powerful brain processor and we will talk about it, how to develop a powerful brain processor. Desire is a very useful and necessary emotion. It allows us to achieve something and make us very active. Without desire, we will be lifeless, dead, or like stones. However, what we need to do is to satiate our channel, our desires, so that they get fulfilled without too much taxing of resources, materials, and energy. Satiation of desire requires energy and material resources. An excessive desire leads to greed and hence to unsustainability. A person's wisdom therefore helps to keep a check on desire. In its absence, the mind goes into an ever-expanding spiral of greed and excess. Unresolved desires therefore produce memory knots or stresses, which have the mechanism of always directing the brain to them and creating anger, frustration, and hence depression. This happens because the thought production is channeled or influenced by the existing memories. If our brain has more memory knots of unfulfilled desire, then the new thoughts will be centered and focused around them, leading to anger and frustration. A stressed mind also gets angry very fast. Anger is an emotion which occurs when things don't happen the way we want them. Thus, a powerful processor or a mind which can coolly and calmly look at it and evaluate all the possibilities. Deep thought helps to do that. May have better conflict and anger resolution capabilities than a shallow thinking mind. Thus, insecurity and anger may be related. So how do we reduce greed and achieve happiness? Happiness is a state of mind. We feel happy and enjoy life through our senses and the mind. The brain processes the information from the senses and our level of happiness is dictated by its processing power. A powerful brain or the processor which produces deep thought can therefore extract more information from the sensory signals and can give us more happiness since the mind gets satisfied easily. Besides, it can look at a greater number of eventualities and hence can resolve the issues amicably. A smaller processor obviously needs many more inputs to reach the same enjoyment or satisfaction level. Thus, weaker brains need more resources to occupy them and this leads to greed and unsustainable life cycle. And most of the politicians and the greedy people are have small weaker brains and they want to possess more and more.
A powerful brain or a processor also changes the priorities in life and helps in focusing on getting personal happiness through mental peace rather than satisfaction of material needs. Such a brain allows us to think deeply and concentrate during which we can get lost in the processing that information. When concentration on a single thought is carried out regularly and continuously for a very long time, it takes our mind away from our insecurities and hence gives us a feeling of calmness, well-being and happiness. The insecurity of human beings comes when they have nothing to do. An empty mind is a devil's workshop is an old saying. Thus activities such as hoarding of the wealth and material goods are the result of a shallow mind. Such a mind seeks enjoyment and gets it in activities like binge shopping etc. A powerful mind is capable of finding enjoyment within and makes a person self-contented and happy. Thus the act of accumulation or hoarding of anything is a sign of lower intelligence level since it is driven by fear complex of losing out or not having enough. For example, we can only wear one shirt and one pant at a time. So what is the need to have 100 shirts and pants? Similarly, we can live in one house or drive one car. So what is the need to have many houses and a dozen cars? A powerful mind can therefore resolve these issues and can lead to a sustainable lifestyle. One of the aspects of a powerful processor and an evolved brain is that it also becomes acutely aware and sensitive of its surroundings. Awareness happens because of the need for maximization of experience and the brain seeks ever expanding spheres of experience. Thus it is able to expand its horizon to encompass our world, solar system and universe. This expansion gives us a tremendous sense of peace, tranquility and perspective on our life. This is the genesis of wisdom. This awareness and sensitivity to surroundings is, is also the genesis of ahimsa or non-violence since this makes life, all life sacred. Wisdom and non-violence towards nature helps us in living sustainably and not becoming corrupt. So how does one produce a powerful processor? Focus on a single thought or a desired object for a long time is the essence of yoga. It's called Sayyam in Patanjali Yoga Sutras. This is also called concentration, meditation or dhyan. Success in, in any field is directly proportional to the concentration that we can put on that field. All great ideas, thoughts, inventions have come by people who had a power of intense concentration. Sayyam <clears throat> on any idea or object also produces happiness. A possible mechanism could be that this concentration somehow helps stimulate or tickles the pituitary gland and gives us a sense of well-being. Meditation and increased concentration not only helps produce a powerful processor but also have a tremendous impact on the physical body. <clears throat> a large body of scientific data now exists which shows the beneficial effect of meditation on heart, blood pressure and the whole horde of modern ailments. Besides, it is a great stress reliever and the modern lifestyle produces tremendous conflict in the mind and creates mental stress. Meditation therefore can help in relieving the stress. One is never too old to learn meditation. To become better human beings, we should therefore learn to cultivate deep thought and focus. So how do we create the conditions for us to think deeply and produce a powerful brain? Today's society does not put a premium on reading or thinking deeply about something. The pace of life together with information overload from TV, radio and other electronic media is creating a new generation of humans and with a very short time span focus. Deep thought requires energy, application and will to achieve it. 
short attention span does not require much effort and hence is easy on the mind however if we consciously create in our children from the early very early stage age the desire to read which will make them cultivate the habit of imagination and daydreaming then there is a chance of creating society which is more focused and happier thus if the children are trained right from kindergarten kindergarten on how to make their minds powerful and focus on reading thinking and contemplation they can then we can create a gentler and more sustainable society the small individual step for a corruption less society therefore starts with the school children who have an active imagination they dream a lot the brain of an active child is a very powerful and in the absence of any structured thought or focus starts a movie of imagination once this movie is started then there is a continuous flow of thoughts in this direction and the movie gets bigger and bigger till it takes on a life of its own children do it because it is a genesis of deep thought and brings happiness to them however for this free flow imagination to take place it is necessary that children are challenged intellectually this puts a heavy onus on teachers how to have excellent teachers who inspire and instill in young children a desire to learn think deeply and have a sense of what is wrong and what is right is a great challenge for all of us nevertheless it is worth pursuing for the betterment of future india i must also add that too often morality is brought into the place play to stop corruption it is a common refrain that because the moral fiber of the society is fractured or weak it leads to corruption morality is fine if it is by it is based on universal truths when it is based on human laws which are not acceptable to all then it brings morality to bear on reducing corruption can lead to more mental knots a simpler mechanism is that once the greed impulse is reduced life becomes simpler and there is no need to hoard goods and resources this automatically reduces the corruption now i will talk about the relevance for corporate world today the corporate world is presented in a pretty poor light they are considered as fueling corruption by colluding with politicians in land grabbing shady deals and parking their ill gotten wealth abroad among others not all but however not all corporations are corrupt nevertheless they will have to do a lot more work to remove the stigma and perception of corruption and insensitivity to the plight of poor people i believe that the corporate world has a tremendous power to reduce corruption and help in sustainable development they control the mass media which can be a great agent of change in a modern democratic society the mass media can play a vital role in educating people to live sustainably and highlighting the corrupt practices of various agencies and individuals it is trying to do so but in a limited way and much more needs to be done the corporate world is a part of a society it is made of people like you and me if society suffers because of corruption and non governments then the corporate world will also suffer too that is thus it is in their interest to be very active in reducing corruption once the people who head the corporations have the greed in check they can then contribute tremendously to the betterment of society without the wisdom and the powerful brain processor the captains of industry get caught up in number games the result they they do not care about how they can make a difference in the lives of unfortunate fellow beings but get completely bogged down in superlative number games such as biggest checks highest turnover maximum profit etc etc one of the aspects of a powerful and sensitive mind is that makes you humble thus you do not do things to show off and keep up with the jonasu this helps one focus on issues of greater good an insensitive mind on the other hand gets its high from numbers and not in creating a better world a sensitive mind also becomes empathetic to its surroundings 
and this gives rise to the desire to give back something to the society and help less fortunate fellow beings. All round us are examples of poverty. Around 60% of our rural population lives in primitive conditions. They have no electricity, no safe drinking water and cook on primitive biomass stores. Their lives are stuck in the dark ages. Besides the poor quality of energy and devices available to them, indoor air pollution caused by cooking on biomass stoves kills about 4 lakh people in rural India every year. An enlightened corporate world can provide goods and services and solutions to improve the quality of life and bring this huge mass of people into mainstream development process. This can only happen when they reduce the greed for enormous profits. The corporate world which has the resources, funds and capabilities can therefore play a very vital role in this process. I believe that the whole purpose of our existence is to increase personal and societal infrastructure. Personal infrastructure includes personal health, happiness and general well-being. By improving our personal infrastructure, we become better human beings and it helps in our emotional growth and evolution. By giving back to the society so that its infrastructure increases, we can help in mankind's evolution. Both these activities when carried out simultaneously can give us a great joy and satisfaction. There are few corporate leaders worldwide who are following this philosophy. Warren Buffet, the great American philanthropist, has given most of his wealth to the charities. He lives a simple but decent life and feels that wealth should be used for helping the unfortunate fellow beings. He seems to be following Gandhiji's trusteeship model in which the Mahatma had mooted the idea that generation of wealth by the corporate world should be done for maximum good and not for personal benefit and grandeur. Closer to home, Jamshedji Tata was another such great philanthropist in early 1900. There is a need for captains of present in corporate world to follow these examples. Finally, it is a sobering thought to consider that numbers and type time are on the side of the rural population. The recent events in the Middle East and the spread of Maoist movement in the country have shown that population which has information available through mass media like TV or cell phones etc but with no means of improving their lives can create very unstable conditions which are not conducive to the economic growth of the country. It is therefore in the interest of corporate world to engage these marginalized people because it is possible that India Inc. will not progress or even survive without the 60% of rural population and marginalized people being brought into the mainstream development. That can only happen when goods and services to improve the quality of life are provided at reasonable cost, something that the corporate world can do easily if they reduce the greed. The corporate world can also take lessons from the history of freedom movement. With the major, major industrialists of India wholeheartedly supported Gandhiji's program by providing intellectual and financial capital to it. There were many greedy industrialists and the people with means during Gandhiji's time, but he gave them a higher purpose on, in life of being a part of the freedom struggle. This helped large populations sublimate the greed for getting independence for India. I think helping the 60% rural population to improve the quality of life could be a new higher purpose. Thus the corporate world helping in this process together with the direction of the greed can play an extremely important role in building a sustainable, happy and great India. Thank you very much.